What's up folks, Nate here to Aldina Works, but clearly not in the shop today. I'm actually sitting here on my back deck just reviewing data. And while it's fresh in my mind, I just want to quickly share with you guys sort of the analytics and like the raw numbers of what the latest modifications we've done to the R9 actually gained us. Because this last time we sent Mark out there to the ridge with the Ram airbox and the short velocity stacks installed, and the last time we raced it out there, we just had the DNA Stage 2 kit and the stock velocity stacks. So I was curious to see, because we've already covered what it did on the dyno, how that actually shook out once we got onto the track to see what that really provided us. But before we dive into just kind of the hard data analytics, let's quickly just look at a lap of Mark riding our R9 here this last week at the Ridge Motorsports Park. Right about when John Gessner, who is likely going to walk away with the number one plate this year with Limer and Omra, decided to pass him in turn 13 at the Ridge on his also two-wheel Dynaworks tuned and set up ZX6. Funny enough, both of those guys, about a lap after I just cut that footage, actually both won their respective races on track at the exact same time. For whatever reason, really don't even get me started here, Wimmer did not want to allow the R9 to race in the 600 class, so they put all of the next-gen Supersport bikes in a 750 class, which is an open 750 Superbike class. The R9 does not belong there whatsoever. Uh, so Mark is leading the 750 class, and John Gessner is running away with all the 600 classes. Every once in a while, because they wave start in like a handful of seconds off from one another, we end up with scenarios where we actually get to see footage of our man Mark DeGrasse with our guy John Gessner racing each other on bikes that we set up and tuned for both of them. So that's always pretty fun to see. And that's what you got to see there. Clearly, the R9 has just a bit of a disadvantage when it's going down the straightaway, still compared to a properly built and set up ZX6. But the chassis is just so damn good that he's actually able to close that gap up into some of the heavier braking zones before John starts to gain just a little bit more time on him as he's exiting those corners. Now, we were hoping to close that gap quite a bit because the last time we went out there on the R9 with Mark, the bike did not have the Ram Air Kit and had the stock velocity stacks. His best time out there was about a 150-1.6. This time that we went out there, we were at about a 149.1. That's a massive 2.6 second difference. So clearly, there was a huge improvement made. And to be clear, we made zero changes to the motorcycle besides that Ram Air kit and the velocity stacks versus how he raced it about a, eh, a month ago or so and this last weekend. And clearly, there's that huge 2.6 second gap. So right off the bat, you'd assume that the Ram Air kit provided an enormous top-end improvement. 
And if we highlight some of the areas here where you're trying to carry as much speed as you possibly can, you're on the throttle as long as you possibly can at the Ridge Motorsports Park, which is still a very tight technical track. So we're not going to see huge high speed areas here. You do notice some top end improvements. He was about a mile and a half faster there that time. And out here, he was about two and a half mile an hour faster. Out here, he went about, eh, what is that, 3.4 mile an hour faster. But way out here at the very end of the straightaway, which is really where the Ram Air Kit was going to kind of show its effectiveness the most. The last time he was out there on his best lap, he did 135.0 mile per hour. If I drag this over to the very edge here, he just carried it a bit farther this time to 135.8. He really just stayed in the throttle a little bit longer to gain that 0.8 mile per hour. And there was actually no significant top speed difference going down the straightaway, even though we see the big lap time drop. Now, a lot of folks may be confused by that, but actually that's pretty much what I expected to see. The Ridge has a very short straightaway before the chicane kicks in. Even with 140 horsepower bikes in the Moto America Supersport class, you're seeing like low 140 mile an hour at the absolute most. And Ram Air just is not providing an enormous benefit at those speeds. So we'll get back to why we actually see these mile an hour differences here in some of these other corners, actually in a lot of these other corners, in just a minute. Because really, the proof that's in the pudding, so to speak, is taking a look at the AFR data as we are going down this straightaway that we logged this time we were out there versus how we saw the AFR on the dyno. So let's take a look at this starting right back here at 100 mile an hour. Up here at the top where I'm wiggling the mouse right now, you can see the AFR in real time while we're going down this straightaway. It does not really move off about a 12.5 to 1 to a 12.6 to 1 AFR whatsoever. You see these spikes right here, and that's just him making a shift. So you're obviously going to have a quick lean spike there as the quick shifter works. But when you're actually just pinned on the throttle, it's pretty much stuck at 12.5, 12.6 at the absolute leanest. Now, anybody that knows like literally anything about tuning a modern liquid cooled and naturally aspirated motorcycle engine, like what's in the R9, We'll know that a 12.5 or 12.61 AFR at wide open throttle is actually a little bit on the rich side. It's pretty darn conservative, but it's actually what I was kind of expecting to see. I tuned the bike statically as it sat on the dyno in the last video we posted at a 13.0 to 1 AFR, just perfectly flat, dead nuts 13.0. However, just in case I was wrong about how much ram air was actually going to be generated at the speeds we'd see at the Ridge Motorsports Park, I added like 4 to 5% pretty much everywhere at wide open throttle just in case, because I didn't want to be wrong, have the Ram Air actually really start taking effect, because I've seen it lean out 3-4% or so on some of the bigger bikes at higher speeds, and all of a sudden have that thing cooking like 13.4 or 13.5 to 1 AFR going down the straightaway, so that's a little on the crispy side. So just to be conservative, 12.5 to 12.6 is pretty much exactly where I left it after we rolled it out of the dyno room, and I made those quick trims to sort of roughly compensate for the Ram Air, and that's exactly where it stayed. Because you can see even at one of the slower speed corner exits I just targeted there, like leaving turn six, you're only about 70-ish mile an hour or so, still the exact same, 12.5, 12.6 to 1 AFR. So that four or 5% I added as we rolled it off the dyno just was completely unnecessary. Didn't matter if we were at 70 mile an hour or 135 mile an hour, we were still sitting at the exact same AFR, regardless of speed and regardless of any sort of ram air improvement that we saw from that kit. So knowing all that, why did he go two and a half seconds faster this weekend versus last weekend? Because the data doesn't say that the Ram Air bought a shit, at least at a track like the Ridge. But Mark's subjective opinion and feedback of riding the bike was that it actually felt sharper and crisper than it ever had before. And he was able to drive out of corners faster. And that comes back to one other point that I did cover in our previous comparison video which was that, yes, we actually did lose quite a bit of power and torque through the bottom two-thirds of the rev range or so, just to gain a little bit at the top end with the intake configuration we have now between the velocity sacks and the Ram Air kit, but it does linearize the power curve. And he was able to actually get on the gas sooner in many corners, which if you get on the gas sooner, you can be on the gas longer, and therefore you will gain more top speed between one corner and the next, which is exactly what we see here on the data. A really good example of a more linear power curve helping us out here was as you're exiting turn 12. So this is a pretty slow corner here. Turn 12 goes straight uh, into this little back straight section here into turn 13. And he was able to get on the gas sooner as he was leaving turn 12 with that more linear curve. And it 
pays dividends. I mean, you're gaining, you know, two, three, what's the very peak here? Almost four mile an hour difference in between turn 12 and turn 13 before he's got to get on the brakes. And that is just from being able to get on the gas sooner with that more linear power curve. And that is why subjectively everything just felt sharper and crisper, as he put it, to him. If you can get on the gas sooner when you're leaned over further on the edge of the tire, you can build your momentum more quickly as you're exiting the corner. Now, with sort of the huge torque humps and power humps in the previous configuration, while yes, it does make less power and torque now in the bottom two-thirds of the rev range, you're actually able to load up the throttle sooner before you just blow off the tire or start riding the traction control. So he was able to actually get out of almost every single corner at the Ridge Motorsports Park sooner, and therefore build full throttle faster, and therefore get to the next corner quicker with this current configuration. It had nothing to do with the Ram Air, and that was pretty much everything to do with those velocity stacks, which on a dyno, objectively, are worse in two-thirds of the rev range. It's also worth noting that linearizing the power curve, even when you're losing power further back in the rev range, especially in a place where you're not really using it all that often, like the bottom third or so that we're just never at, we're like never below 6,000 RPM ever on this racetrack, uh, it builds confidence in you as a rider when you're out there on the track. And we see that in the data as well. He had much more confidence this time than he did last time. He rolled through corners, literally almost every corner actually, faster than he did the last time we were out there because in his subjective opinion the bike just felt better with that small change again it was really just the velocity sacks the ram air bought us nothing but just linearizing that curve as much as we possibly could paid us huge dividends to the tone of 2.6 seconds i pretty rarely do videos like this where i'm really diving deep into data analysis because there's honestly a lot of stuff i don't want other tuners out there to see at the end of the day this is a competitive market we're the pretty sharp end of providing tuning support for these bikes here in the sport, especially with our involvement with some of the factory back teams. So a lot of stuff here I'm just never going to share with people, but there is a lot of stuff that I can share with you guys. There is no reason whatsoever to not show you guys GPS speed and, you know, time gain from lap to lap. Even when it comes down to stuff like, uh, you know, requested throttle position, never going to show you guys actual, but requested throttle position, uh, engine RPM, stuff like that. So if seeing some more of this in-depth data analysis is stuff that you guys like, definitely leave me a comment because while it is very time consuming to go ahead and set this up and kind of film this more analytical approach to diving into a lot of the data here, this nerdy stuff is actually what I really enjoy doing. And honestly, what kind of sets our tuning apart from a lot of other folks out there because we do this type of testing on the track with very high level riders like Mark DeGrasse. So if you like it, leave a comment. I'll consider doing more of it in the future. But until then, if you're a new R9 owner, or you're going to be buying one in a coming season, and you're going to be doing track days or racing this platform, and you're looking to get more power to your bike, definitely stick around, like, subscribe, because the very next video we're going to show you guys is what happens when you drop a super bike head on a bone stock bottom end, and the huge performance improvements that that additional compression and airflow provides.